Good evening. How you guys doing? Everybody good? So, I don't have to tell you this. I know you've heard the phrase, making a statement. Did you see what they did? Did you see what they wore? Did you hear about such and such? And maybe you've heard somebody throw out the phrase, making a statement. But our, uh, our God quite literally made uh, a statement. That's what the series is about. And he, there's seven times in John's gospel that Jesus says, I am. And then following that, he tells us something about him uniquely, and, and oftentimes it, it has everything to do with our relationship. But absolutely, Jesus made a incredible statement with his life and, and his ministry really on earth that only lasted a few years. And here we are, the most sang about individual in the history of the world, the most celebrated, maybe the most hated also, but certainly the most emulated, and, uh, and that is Jesus. And I, I love and I really appreciate the Gospel of John. If you are new to the faith, it's an incredible place to start if you're reading your Bible because I believe it helps us, probably at least to me, it, it helps us in the most clear way see who Jesus is. And you really understand that Jesus is not just a good guy. He's not a rabbi. He's not a teacher. He wasn't just a prophet. That he literally is God. And this very unique relationship that we have with him. And so I love it. And this is week six. And, I, and I'm so glad you're here tonight. Um, I, I've learned a lot, actually, just uh, in studying this in depth. And so we're going to pick up. If you if you're not um, familiar, and maybe you haven't caught some of these, I'll, I'll just want to do like a small little recap. These are things that Jesus said, helping us understand who he was. He said he was the bread of life, meaning that he didn't intend on us. He designed you and me, by the way. And very much just like you need food, you need uh, energy, or you will quite literally die, we need God in that very same way. Like, like he designed us to be dependent on him. Uh, he, he really is life. So he said he was the bread of life. He said he was the light of the world. And we really talked about all of the good in the world. It came from Jesus. Uh, anywhere where there's not gospel, you find the darkest of the dark. I mean, you, you just find evil in a level that a lot of us really can't understand. But it is really Jesus that brought light into the world. And that's why we have the good that we do have. He said he was the door, meaning that there's not multiple paths to God. He said nobody could come to God the Father and experience eternity with God unless they came through him, that there was no other path. It's very, very narrow. There's just one way, and he said he was that. He said he was the good shepherd. He said he would walk with you. He wants to walk with me through life. And our relationship with him is very much like that of a sheep and a shepherd. He'll cause you to, to lie down in green pastures. Like you need to chill out and take a nap. Quit worrying about this. I've got this. There's moments when, when he'll do that. There's moments when he'll, he'll need to lead you beside still waters, which is a way of protecting you and, and getting what you need. There's, there's a season then as a shepherd who'll restore your soul. And again, it makes it very clear that he's the only one that is able to do this. And then last week we said he is the resurrection. Literally, you will rise from the dead. And that only is possible through Jesus Christ, and he certainly is the best life that you could ever have. And so tonight we're going to move on, like I said, to the sixth part of this, and I just kind of want to set this a little bit. I always like to know when they're talking and you hear some of these, I would call them famous passages of Scripture, I love to know the setting. I like stories. I tell a lot of stories. I heard a lot of stories growing up. And so it just always kind of helps me to understand the setting. And so in this setting, before Jesus makes this statement, he's essentially preparing his disciples uh, for his departure. He's, he's about to leave. Like he is going soon. And you can see he's attempting to get them ready to, to comfort them. These are guys, mind you, that have given up pretty much everything to follow him. 
and, and they've been with him and they have seen some absolutely incredible things. They were there when he fed the 5,000. He did this again and fed 4,000. They've seen the miracles, the water and the wine. These guys were there. Last week we talked a lot about Lazarus, which was a friend of theirs, and he literally brought him back to life. Scripture says right after that miracle that, that the fame and the word of Jesus spread so much that, that he had to quit uh, publicly preaching and speaking because the crowds and the mobs were huge and they were almost living like outlaws. Uh, they, they were constantly under threat of being arrested or stoned to death. And so that's kind of the setting. And, and Jesus has these uh, men and they're sitting down I would imagine, and he's telling them what we're about to read. And so this is John 14. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. He says, there's more than enough room in my father's house. If there were not so, what I've told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's, that's very good news for all of us that have put our faith in Jesus. He said, um, verse three, when everything is ready, I'll come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. Now this reaction here in verse five makes total sense because I can only imagine the look on their face with everything that's happened. They're, they're following around Jesus. Jesus is supporting them. I mean, here they are. They've been in the thick of it and he sits them down and he's saying, I'm gonna go, but don't worry. I'm going to my father's house. It's a big house. I got a room for you. That, that probably went over their heads. Well, in fact, we know if you read on in scripture that it did go over their head. But I, I, I like this reaction because it's very honest. And it was like, no, we don't know. Like Jesus, we have no idea. This is Thomas. We have no idea where you're going. So how could we know the way? And Jesus says this, this is our statement for tonight. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. Then he finishes up, he says, if you'd really known me, you would know who my Father is. Like, they're almost there. They, they, they're, they're struggling with this. How can a man this man that's in front of me also be God, but it is clicking. Then I love this. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him because they are literally looking at God in the eyes. It's pretty powerful. By your head, please. Father, in Jesus' name, we just invite your Holy Spirit to be here with us. Help us to understand your word, to, to learn from your word. Lord, we know that we're dependent on your Holy Spirit to even understand what we're talking about. Father, your word always works. It always produces fruit. Speak to us tonight. Do anything you want. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. So the way. Let's start there. Man, we have it so good. I was talking to uh, my oldest son, Riley, not too long ago. And the conversation somehow ended up on like how we navigate. It was like, Dad, before your phone, how did you know where you were going, and 90% and of the time, I had no idea where I was going. But it's funny, the world that we live in, because we, we give almost no thought now on finding things and navigating. But I very much remember even like MapQuest, and you put in the address, and you printed it out, and, and you know, it took like 45 minutes, and, and you made your notes, and you needed to know when, I, when I'm on this road, I'm looking for this exit, and you had to actually like chart a course. And even before that, I'm old enough to remember, you, you, you kind of had an idea, but you would get in the car, and you would go, and you would drive, and inevitably, at some point, you would have to pull over, oftentimes at a gas station, and, you know, like go buy a Slim Jim or something so they wouldn't get mad at you. But you would go to that shelf that had all of the crappy maps. And they were like bent up and, and there was typically another guy in there. And, you know, his wife's like out in the parking lot shaking their head. And you're, you got a map out and you're trying to figure out where in the name of God you're at. So I've been there a lot. Well, well now we have it so, so good compared to that. That really honestly wasn't all that long ago. But the navigating part of things in life, man, it's not easy. Navigating 
parenting and, and, and being kids and, and navigating all the life choices, navigating a human soul, navigating your own heart that Scripture says is the most deceitful thing. And so we, we very much need to know what's the way. Like, like, how do we know with all these choices? Who are you going to marry? Where are you going to go to school? Where are you going to work? When's the time to do this or that or change? Or, or what do my kids need? What do I need? There's just so many big things that we need answers to. And so you, you better believe that we need to know the way to go. In a lot of ways, that's the deeper part of Thomas's question. Question, how do we know where to go? How do we know when we're going to get there, essentially. I, I thought about this because it is very easy to get lost. I talk to a lot of people, and, and they tell me, I, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. I feel stuck. I don't, I don't know what to do right now in this season of life. And I get it, that it's complex. In aviation, flying, or, 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 uh, or navigation on the, on the seas and ocean, there's something called the one in 60 rule. And essentially, for every one degree a plane veers off course, it, it misses its target by a destination of one mile for every 60 miles that you travel. So it doesn't really seem like it's, it's dramatic. After 100 yards, I didn't add this up, but somebody did online, but after 100 yards, it's only like five feet. So if you were going here, but you were one degree off, you're gonna miss your target by about five feet. After a mile, it would be about 92, or nine, yeah, 92.2 feet. But if you fly for several hours, if you keep this pace up, in, in just a few hours, you will literally be 500 miles off of your intended destination. And I, and I very much understand and I know that life is like that for a lot of people. You don't intend to get over here. This relationship, I, sometimes people are like, I don't even know why I'm in this relationship. I don't know how I got here. I don't even know why I took that job. I, I don't even know why I went over here. And it really is very easy to look up one day and say, man, like this is not at all what I had in mind. And so I so appreciate that Scripture's talking about this navigating season, that we're not on our own. Jesus was not leaving these guys on their own. They, they were scared. They, they didn't know. But there's no way the God that loved us, that went to these extreme lengths to save us, to die for us, would just leave us here. So, so what's the answer? And I love this. And, and, and I really believe that it is not as complex is we make it out to be. Because the answer is in Hebrews 12 too. It says, we do this. What's he talking about? Running our race, staying our course, following God's plan. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. He's the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy waning him, he endured. Sometimes you have to endure. You have to go through a season. It's very unpleasant. You don't understand why it's the way that it is, but you have to endure. It says he endured. He thought about the joy, the future awaiting him. He, he, he knew the cross. He disregarded its shame. It says now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. There's two things I want to point out. Jesus initiates our faith. You are a Christian if you're a Christian because of Jesus, because he literally initiated that. You had to be somewhere, mom, dad, grandparents, church, Sunday school, somewhere you heard the gospel. And if you really are a follower of Christ, you heard it, you believed it, something happened in your spirit. I don't care if you were a kid, an adult, whatever, like this, this one I'm talking about, it happened, and that's how you're a Christian. You put your faith in what you heard and believed. But Scripture tells us it's God. It's the Holy Spirit that actually initiates that. He starts that. That's why what we're doing here, what you're doing, church, this is why spreading the gospel is so important. The, the chosen instrument, the vehicle that God uses to do that on earth right now is you guys. It, it, it's the church. So he initiates it, but this is the part that I, I want to really get to. He perfects it. He, he's not done. 
You, you give your life to Christ, but then he, he's perfecting it. He's, he's performing it, one translation says. He stretches you. He grows you. He, he, he says, you need to add this. You need to take out this. And there's this process, should be all of your life, where he's working this out. When, when he's talking about work out your, your salvation with fear and trembling, it's not saying, oh my God, I'm so terrified of the Lord and what he's gonna do. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying work it out with respect and in and, and awe and knowing God is not done. He will perfect your faith. And, and this is very much a part of knowing the way that you should go. Getting lost is slightly terrifying. I, I hate not knowing where I'm going in the car. But the, the truth is, I, I don't have to worry about it too much these days because I have this cool little app called Waze, and I love it. It's amazing. And for me, honestly, like I just punch it in, and that's it. And I just follow that. And honestly, I would be like a buffalo, and I would just follow it off of the cliff. That's how reliant on that thing that I am. I don't zoom out, I don't pinch in and look and see way down there. I virtually never do that. I trust it so much that I just put it in and then I'm gonna get there when I get there. If Kate's wanting to go somewhere in Dallas, we're going to North Park, punch it in, 45 minutes, I'm right there. All I have to do is follow that little thing. Every once in a while, warning, car ahead, warning, object in the road, warning, you slow down ahead. There's these little cautions that you have to watch out for. Warning, angry teenager broke up with boyfriend, texting rampage, extreme caution. You'll it'll throw out information. But that is very much how our relationship with God can and should be. The, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And there, there's very much a process. And, and listen to me, I understand that that probably sounds incredibly vague. And I don't want it to. I want this to be very applicable because this is the kind of stuff that I need help with. One of my weaknesses, I'm telling you right now, I am an overthinker and I will analyze the heck out of something. But at some point, we have to stop. We have to say, no, 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 that's not what God is actually calling me to do. Let him do all the analyzing. I, I'm just gonna look down. I don't have to worry about 10, 15, 20 moves ahead. I just have to follow this little thing right here. And if he says, hey, there's gonna, there's gonna be a slowdown up ahead, that's okay. Let, let's just take it slow for a little bit. When he says, watch out, debris in the road, we're just gonna drive around that. And that is what we get in the help and the person of the Holy Spirit. They're all working together. They're all perfecting our faith and our trust and our reliance on God together. So what does this look like? If, if I told you if, you, if you were thinking about this message later on tonight, you're like, well, you know, I, I heard we need to focus on God. We need to focus on Jesus. That's how we find the way. This is what that looks like to me because, I, again, I don't want this to be vague. For me... I have to get up early. Maybe you don't, but I have to get up early and I, and I have to pray. I, if you're gonna hear a voice, if you're driving in your car and unless you have your phone connected to your Bluetooth and it's blaring out of your speakers, you'll miss it. And life right now is so crazy noisy that it can be very difficult to hear from God unless you plan for it. So I get up and I pray and I get up early before the rest of my family and, and I pray. And I pray about the things that I know. I typically start by thanking God for, for what he's already done. I literally follow Philippians 4, and that's where I start. 4, 5, and 6. That, that's like, that is it. I, I don't worry about anything, so anything I'm worried about, I cast my care on the Lord. Then he says, pray about everything, so I just pray. Friends that I know need something, something that, 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 that I'm concerned about, I pray. I have a time where I do that. And then it says, thank God for what he's already done, so I do that. So I just, God, I thank you for this. Lord, I'm, I'm so blessed. You've helped me over here. I've had this, and, and so I, I pray through that. And then I'm telling you like clockwork, the Bible tells us what'll happen. It says you'll experience peace that passes all understanding. Then it says his peace, this is not a peace that you can get from medication, this is not a peace that you can get from any other way in the world because this is God's peace. 
And it says it'll help you guard your heart and your mind. And so I spend a few minutes doing that. I, I, I pray, I get quiet, I typically read a Bible plan, and then I have a prayer journal. And, and then I try to get quiet because I'm gonna tell you right now, if your prayer life is just you telling God everything that you want him to do, you're missing 99% of it. He's not your genie. This is a two-way deal. It's your, your life and if your prayer language is just you telling God what you want, then you're missing so, so much because what if you get everything that you want? Probably will end in disaster. So you have to get to a place in life where you shut up and you listen. You say, God, show me. What, what do I need to change? What do I need to work on? Maybe your attitude is stunk. If, is, has anybody in there ever had a bad attitude before? Two of you guys, three of you guys have. Every once in a while, listen, whatever it is, if you'll pray and you'll get quiet, if I'm having a problem with attitude, then there's typically always a gratitude deficit. And so I've learned, I'll think of scriptures, I'll write them down, things that I'm, I'm praying about, uh, scriptures that I know that I need, and I'll quote them, and I'll think about them, I'll meditate them, and this is something I started doing not too long ago. I started just having like a gratitude journal. And I'll get down and I'll literally just start thinking about all of the things that I'm grateful for, big things, small things, just over silly things Ella has said, things that I enjoy doing with my boys, a, a trip that I took just, to, I mean, just one after another. Sometimes it feels weird, and I, and I don't even feel like doing it, but man, you get started, and then you just start writing and writing and writing. And, and that allows the Holy Spirit to work. That allows you to refocus on Him. Because us worrying, Scripture reminds us over and over and over and over again, why worry? Like, why? Like, what are we going to do to change anything? We need God. And so we have to refocus. And I'm just telling you, that is how we stay focused on Jesus. In any, any sport involving, I guess, a ball for that matter, there's something called target fixation. And I don't care if it's tennis, if it's pickleball, like I play, if it's baseball, golf, whatever, what's the one thing that they tell you? Keep your eyes on the ball, like it's universal. Because it works, that's what we need to do. And target fixation is, is very real. Whatever you look at and focus on, you're always poor, uh, pulled toward that, like always. If it's in a car, you're so much more likely to hit whatever you're looking at. So you and I, in our relationship with Jesus, him saying, I am the way, he wants us looking at him literally like he is the fixed target because he is, because that's where we will keep moving. And then we don't have to zoom out on our phone and see the final destination and try to find it. He's not asking us to do any of that. He just wants us to look down and, and he's opening this step. He, he, the steps, the steps of a righteous person are established of the Lord. He didn't say the map. He didn't say the quarter mile. He, he said literally the steps. Can I get an amen? That's how you stay on the way. And, and, and listen to me, I wanna just throw this in. Maybe you hear the rerouting, turn around, turn around, you know, when you miss your exit, rerouting, God's got that too. Maybe you messed up, maybe the relationship was messed up, maybe you know you should have never been in it in the first place, and, and it's the devil and he's lied to you and he's told you you've messed up, you've blown your opportunity, you've blown your chance, that's absolutely nothing for God to get you turned right back around if you look at him. Can I get an amen? That's what he does. That's, that's why he is the way and nothing else is. In life, you move, you move toward whatever has your attention. So make sure your attention is on what matters most. He also said he's the truth. I'm the way, I'm the truth. And then we'll get to the life in just a moment. But knowing the way it, 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 that is really only possible. I mean, finding out the truth is only possible if you know the way. It's like you'll, you'll never get to the truth part if you don't know the way to go. Like these all build right on top of e 
each other. It's like Jesus planned it that way. It's incredible, but of course you have to know the way to get to the truth. And we do very much live in a world right now where, man, the world's version, the culture's version, version of truth changes about every five seconds. The, the, the goal keeps moving. The target keeps moving. And, and so if you're getting your information and your truth from our world or just the leaders or the wisdom of the world or whatever, maybe some's good, maybe some's bad, but I think anybody just about could agree it's changing like constantly. So it can cause a tremendous amount of confusion. Truth is just simply the property of being in accord with fact or reality. That's why when the Bible talks about God being the same yesterday, today, and forever, it's so important. Because he never, ever, ever changes. And if he ever has said anything, you don't have to worry if it's gonna fall out of fashion or if it's gonna quit working. If he said your relationships need to look like this or you need to implement this or you need to handle money like this, then you don't have to wonder. It works now and 50 billion years in the future, it's still going to work. In fact, scripture, speaking of God's word, says it will never, ever fade. It will never lose its luster. That there's not one single word, not, not one punctuation mark of God's word will ever fade. So it's here, it's eternal. And I'm just telling you, like in a world that changes on a dime, man, that is needed more than ever. Because there's a lot of lying. There's a lot of deception out there. How many guys have noticed that? I mean, it's just everywhere. Just turn on anything, read anything, and you'll find so much de deception. Uh, Ella today, I, I just, I probably shouldn't laugh about this, but I was studying for this. I had my AirPods on and our dog like walks in and, and I think she's limping at first. She's walking all funny. Our dog is like this big. And I noticed she's wearing Ella's baby doll's clothes. And then I saw, so I hear the little pitter patter of Ella's feet and she runs in there laughing. And, and I'm like, how did you even get our dog still enough to do that? So I said, hey, how did those get on there? And she said, Sophie did it. That's our dog's name. I was like, Sophie put your baby doll's dress on her own self. And I told her, I said, you're, you're telling a lie. And so then her eyes got, you know, this big and her lips started quivering. And then I just gave her a bunch of money and I let her run out. No, not really. No, but we, we lie. We do. Like, Everybody has told a lot. You know, on average, there was this study, this fascinates me. Every day we are told, it says on average, there's a lot, a lot of data that made me think this. Because when I first read this, I was like, eh, I don't know. But it says we're told 10 to 15 lies every day. And I'm talking like by people. If you, if you work around people, we're like we're on average, we're lied to 10 to 15. And they said on average, people genuinely tell three to five lies per day. Raise your hand if that's you. No, no, come on. But I know you lie. Of course you lie. About, about little things. We exaggerate. We, we embellish. How many of you guys have sent off a text, I'm on my way? You're not on your way. You're in bed. You haven't even thought about getting on your way. You're not even dressed. And you're telling your friend, I'm on the way. That's a lie. It, it, you set up a dating profile online. I love fitness and walks on the beach. Your fitness routine is walking from the, the fridge to the couch, okay? That's the fitness routine, and you hate the beach. People embellish, they lie, they wanna make themselves look better than reality. It's very much a part of our culture. I was really fascinated in this study. There was an article I came across, and it, it's called News and the culture of lying. It says how journalism really works. I was very, very fascinated by this. It makes a, a strong case and argument, and there's example after example, on, on how just things are being reported. That, that, you know, this outlet will embellish this. They'll leave out this major detail. And it's all to what? To get your attention 
to get you stirred up, to get you fired up, because they want your focus and attention on whatever they're saying. And so the truth gets lost because what? They're trying to sell you ads. And so, so much of this on both sides. It's so difficult to know what the truth is. And that's why more than at any time I've ever been alive, we need to know where the ultimate source of truth is. And you can be rest assured it is only found in God's word. There's no other place. I, I'm not banking on anything other than God's word. About relationships, about money, about parenting, about anything for that matter. You, you have to go to the absolute source because relative truth and all this, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. If I had a cup, it's so hot today in Texas, I think it was like 102, right? So if I had this just amazing looking glass and you thought it was lemonade, and it's a fun little cup. It's got a sunshine on there. He's wearing glasses. There's a straw. There's whipped cream. There's a cherry on it. But if I told you, hey, here this is, but you can't drink it. It's poison. It, it's antifreeze. And, and I've heard antifreeze actually it is like sweet to taste. That's why animals will, will lick it up. If you spill it, you have to be super careful. It doesn't even really smell that bad. But if you said, I don't care, that looks amazing. And, and, and that is not true. That, that would hurt me because... I don't believe it. Well, if somebody grabs that and they drink that, what's gonna happen? It doesn't matter. If they thought it was true, it's true. And so they will be on their way to the hospital or they will die in just a few moments because that is exactly what happens. The truth is out there. And it is very much the truth that, that does set us free. And man, navigating life and the decisions that, that you have to make for your families and your kids and your career, absolutely they're important. But we have to know where truth comes from. And the devil is very much in the business of deceiving you. He wants your focus to be anywhere else. He wants your focus to be on the news. He wants your focus to be on how bad this is or how terrible the economy is or how screwed up things are over here. And I'm not saying let's run around and let's be so ignorant and so uninformed, but does any of that really matter anyway? No. What matters is who is your God and who has your focus? And so the devil would love to get you and me stirred up. And then guess what? We're not keeping our eyes fixed on the one who initiates and perfects our faith. Because it's on all of these other things if we're not careful. The devil wants you to believe a lie. He wants you to believe a lie. He wants you to believe a lie about yourself. Because here's, here's the thing. God's called every single one of you to do something. You have a calling of God on your life to do something. And the devil, he can't do anything about that. The devil has no power or ability to change God's calling on your life. Did you know that? He has no power or ability to take away the gifts that God gave you. He can't do that. But you know what he can do? He can rob you of your confidence. He can put guilt and shame and fear and condemnation on you to where you run away from whatever it is that God's called you to do. Or you're too afraid to use those God-given gifts in your life. That's how he operates, through fear and deception. Because he wants you to think, well, you, you don't have what it takes and you can't do this and you would never succeed in that. But the truth comes in, here's the truth, where God says, no, you are actually more than a conqueror through Christ that loves you. And so that's why it's so important to know God's word, the truth. Psalms uh, 512, surely the Lord will bless the righteous and surround you with favor. I, I know a lot of people and they feel like, well, you know, I've blown it, I've messed up. I don't even feel like God, honestly, should give me uh, another chance anymore. I feel guilty or, or I, I, I don't deserve this. But the Bible says that now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than anything that you could ask or imagine, that's Ephesians 3.20, that's how much he loves you. The devil, it's, it's always a lie. That's why scripture literally says every time he speaks, he's telling lies. It's his native tongue. 
but he wants you to think that relationships, sex, money, if you experience that his way, the world's way, that it's somehow better. But it's a false promise that never, ever, ever lives up. That's why we have to go to the word of God to find out the truth about all of these things that God gave us in the first place. Can I get an amen? It's the truth, it's absolutely the truth that sets us free. There's true north, which is an actual fixed destination that never moves. And I didn't know this, but there's also magnetic north. But there's a lot of interference that can get in the way. It's, a compass just works because of a magnetic field. And I didn't know this, but, but there's something called a, a declination. And every year, if you look at your compass and it's pointing to magnetic north, every single year, did you know it shifts 50 kilometers? It moves because the gravitational pull changes. There's lots of factors. In fact, if, if you got by a large metal object, if you got somewhere that had another magnetic field for some reason, then it wouldn't work. But true north is always true north. And when he says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, you can take it to the bank that he is not changing. And if he said it works, it works. And if he promised it for you, then it is for you. Can I get an amen? That's it. That is it. And we have to know, hey, that, man, that, that's the truth. That, that's what it looks like. That's how I'll find it. John 16, 13 says the spirit of truth when he comes. Talking about the Holy Spirit that helps us in this journey, finding our way. It says when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all truth. He won't speak on his own, but he's gonna tell you what he's heard from God the Father. He says he will tell you about the future. This was such an important thing that Jesus literally prayed for you and me in, in the garden before his departure. And, and li just listen to what he prayed for us. He was just about to go. This is after the resurrection. He says, Lord, make them holy by your truth. This is right before he went to the cross, excuse me. John 17, 17. Make them holy by your truth. And then listen to this. Teach them your word. That's why we gotta know what's in the Bible. Teach them your word, which is the truth. That's the only place you can find it. And it's never, ever changing. He said, I'm the life. As we're wrapping this up, John 1, it tells us that he is quite literally life. Like Jesus' life. Again, this is why I love John's gospel. You get a glimpse of the power that Jesus has. Because it, it just starts off and it says he existed in the beginning with God. So Jesus wasn't a created being. Jesus is, in fact, God. Jesus didn't just show up in the Christmas story. He, he's been here forever. Explain that. I can't. I don't know. But he's God. He existed in the beginning with God, the Father. He created everything. Who? Jesus. He created everything through him. Nothing was created except through him. Jesus. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. It's pretty incredible. He, he is life. He's the one that's holding it all together right now. But, but it's, it's even more than that. It's even deeper than that. The scripture tells us also in John's gospel that it's the thief, our enemy, that's here in this world to deceive you, to lie to you. He doesn't want you to believe in yourself. He wants to rob you of what God wants to do in your life, and that's why it says he's here to steal, kill, and destroy. But it says God, he came, Jesus came, so we could have life to the full. And it literally means a rich, satisfying, full life, what we would call an abundant life. Like that's here. And Jesus is also saying, yes, I am literally life, but I will give you life here, now. These 80, 90, 100 years, I don't know, however much time you got. But he said, I'll give you the real life that you're looking for now. And again, that, that also comes through Jesus. The best possible, possible life. The best version of you will be found in Jesus the very, very best version of you. 
And, and maybe you're not that version right now. I'm not that version right now. All, all life, all my life, I want God to keep working on me, perfecting my faith, helping me see things more clear, adding the things that I need and taking away the things that are hurting me. That's the process, and that is absolutely this life that he's talking about. But I really do, I, I talked about this last week, I think a lot of people, especially right now, that they've tried to set their goal in life by just being happy. Because it sounds nice, I just wanna be happy, I just want my kids to be happy, and sh sure you do, I want my kids to be happy. But happiness is so fleeting. You can, get, you, you can be happy from eating a burrito. <laughs> you can be happy when your favorite sports team wins. But that is not gonna bring you sustaining lifelong happiness and satisfaction. And so to really have a good life, an abundant life, the kind of life that was just described in Scripture, it takes a lot more than that. What it, what it actually takes that we don't talk about all that much is, is walking with Jesus and making a lot of good decisions because they were based on Jesus and building a life where you have meaningful, good, healthy relationships and friendships, a, a, a life where, 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 where your, your family's blessed and you've, you've learned to uh, use some of your God-given gifts and you've learned that life is not all about you and you're very much aware that you're here for a reason by God, made by him, and that your life has value and deep, deep meaning. And then when we live our life to be a blessing to other people and to really use those gifts that came from our creator for his benefit, and not just our benefit, but for his benefit. And yeah, you can use those, some of them for your benefit too. To take care of your family, feed your family, sure. But you're here for even more than just that. If you, if you find that, 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 man, you go through life and, and, and really what's so much more important is making good decisions, staying on that path, that way, and if you stay on that long enough, you make good, healthy decisions. You build a life on the rock, Jesus Christ. Then you'll find happiness won't be something that you have to chase. It'll chase you down. It'll sneak up on you. And you'll have that, those moments of extreme happiness. But life is so much more than just about a feeling of happiness. And the Bible talks about this. And that's why he says, no, I am literally life and I am also your life. He, he's our life source. And if you wanna have this rich and satisfied and meaningful and abundant life, it's only found in him. And you better believe that there is this conflict of truth going on in our world. This is very important to bring up. And I, I wanna wind down with this. I wanna close. 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that, that a natural person, they can't really accept the things of the Spirit. It says they can't accept the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness to this person. They're not able to understand them because these things are spiritually discerned. Some people, they really do. They look at the Bible and they think this is, I mean, what is this? This is a book of rules. And I've always hated that analogy. How many guys have heard that? I've heard that a lot. I mean, it's not. If anything, it, it was much more uh, a story about here's all the rules that you guys could never, ever keep, and I did something about it because I loved you so much, I sent Jesus, and he kept all of them to save you. And it's much more this incredible, beautiful love story. And we have this guide, we have this Bible. I was thinking about it this way. If I was taking a vacation, I was going to some exotic place and I was gonna stay somewhere and I was so excited to go, I might get a travel guide and I might start reading and researching and it would tell me like, yeah, man, you need to go here, hike this trail, be here at this time. You're gonna wanna watch the sunset from this point. You're gonna wanna meet this person. You're gonna wanna go to school over here. I, I, I've got a plan for you. You don't have to figure it all out, but that's very much a way that I think of the Bible is this travel guide. God's word, the supernatural wisdom of God to govern our life, a manual for how 
to live, the wisdom of God. And you better believe that it's always at odds with the world. Anxiety and depression. What's the world say? You just need to self-medicate. You need to focus on yourself. What's the Spirit say? Spirit says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And then the peace of God, which passes all comprehension, will guard your heart and mind. See how, see, see how they're, they're countering with each other. A relationship problem. What, what's the world say? Well, what, what can they do for me? If they come after me, I'm gonna come after them. I'm gonna pay them back. But the spirit, it's always different. That's why this doesn't make sense to the world. He says, no, pray for those that hurt you. He, he says, instead of focusing on all of the things that you see, you got this huge speck in your own eye. He said, you take that out, and then maybe you can see clearly to help other people remove respect from their own eye. But that's always counter to what the world says. The, the world says with, with marriages, do what makes you happy. If your needs are not met, maybe you've fallen out of love. Maybe it's time to bounce. What's, what's, what's the Spirit say? It says, respect your husband. Love your wife. Be mutually submissive to one another. You, you don't have one dominating the other. It says that's not biblical. You, you don't have one making all of the decisions. Ephesians 5, 21, submitting to one another. Why? out of reverence to Christ. That doesn't match the message of the world. Money, get all you can while you're here, and then get more. What's the Spirit say? It says money's the seed, you have to give it away. You have to sow, and if you sow it, you'll reap. It's always different, and this is the point that I'm making. That wisdom, you don't get from the world. That, that instruction, you don't get anywhere else except for the truth, and that truth is absolutely what will give me and you this abundant life. I'll tell you a, a way that I think simplifies this. This is Matthew 10, 39. In essence, it really just says if you chase Jesus as hard as all of the things that you want, all of the things that you think you want, if you chase Jesus as hard as you want those things, you'll end up getting all of that and so much more. That is the wisdom of God. That is very counter to what our culture has to say. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I am the life. Will you bow your head? Jesus finished this statement in verse six, and he, again, he said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life, but he followed it up, and he said, nobody can come to the Father except through me, because he is very much the door, just like he said. And so if you're here tonight, and you don't know Jesus, if you're watching online, and you don't know Jesus, and I don't mean you don't know of him, I'm saying you don't have this relationship. He's not your shepherd. Maybe you don't know who your shepherd is. It's probably you. And you, you've been just trying to shepherd yourself and do the best you can. But the Bible tells us, man, there's... There's an enemy in this world, the devil, and he hates you, and he wants to lie to you. He's counting on lying to you. He's counting on getting you to believe that you're here for no reason. He's counting on you believing that you've messed up too much. He's counting on you believing that God doesn't love you, but those are all lies. And you've heard this message tonight. That's not, that's not the truth. He loves you. He adores you. He died for you. And you can at any point stop and you can turn and he really will reroute your life. Thanks so much for watching. If this message blessed you, be sure to share it with your friends and family and hit subscribe. For more information, head over to our website or click the link below.